Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Julie McCrossan, and uh, just before we start, as people are joining us uh, for this Walper Jewish Hospital Community Forum, I want to welcome you. My name is Julie McCrossan. I'm not sure if you can hear my cavoodle snoring gently in the background. Uh, these are the pleasures of Zoom meetings. Uh, this evening, in a, a few minutes' time, we will be offering you uh, a, a look at what our young people, our children and our adolescents are thinking about and feeling, and we'll be offering you uh, expert advice and reflections upon what we can do as parents, as grandparents, as uh, teachers and as community leaders uh, to make our children uh, feel safe uh, in this time of uh, COVID-19. We're calling our session, as I think you know, managing uh, the mental health of children and young people in the age of uh, COVID-19. And it's all hosted by Walper Jewish Hospital and also a, a special partner who we'll hear about shortly. I can still see quite a few people coming in. So uh, I'll just say a couple more things before we begin. I'd like to acknowledge that we're broadcasting on Aboriginal land, the land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation and to pay my respects uh, to elders past and present. Uh, I'm pleased to let you know that we have three community leaders who will be talking to you about not just this forum, but uh, this forum as part of a series of forums uh, in the age of COVID-19, and we'll have that explained to you. Our fundamental purpose is to share information uh, and things to do to make our children and young people feel safe and supported, as I said. Our format, after our, our, our three welcomes, uh, will be, I will introduce you to four clinical psychologists from the community uh, with extensive experience, both in practice and research. And we'll have opportunities uh, for questions. You'll see uh, on the bottom of your Zoom screen, the Q&A button, you'll be able to put questions through there and Dr. Um, Alan Fell will be moderating those questions and I'll come to him from time to time and we'll hear, hear your questions. The chat function is not operating and uh, uh, also if you wish to do questions anonymously, you can. And just before I begin, I guess if we remember nothing else uh, between now and nine o'clock when we conclude, we, we need to remember that I think it's normal for all of us to feel shaken up uh, during this remarkable period in world history. Uh, but there are many, many sources of help in our community and we're going to be hearing about them tonight. So I think I've, I've chatted with you warmly enough. We now have, I think, a, a good number of people have joined us already. And so I'd like to formally welcome you to the Walper Wellbeing Forum 2020, Managing the Mental Health of Your Child and Adolescent in the Age of COVID-19. And to begin our evening, I'd like to introduce the President of the Board of Walper Jewish Hospital, Richard Glass. Please make him welcome. Thank you, Julie. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. There is no one who has not been affected in some way by this pandemic, and all our lives have changed for the foreseeable future. It's expected that the psychological impacts will touch many more people than, and will endure well beyond the physical, social, and medical impacts of COVID-19. It is so important that people know that it is okay to ask for help, and that they know from where they can get that help. People need to know that they are not alone. In view of that, our wellbeing team have curated a series of seminars to provide our community with some tools and insights to better recognize and deal with the mental health issues that are impacting or may impact those we love or those for whom we are in some way responsible. So for employees, that, that an employer that could be the employees or for carers indeed, it could be their employers. This evening, as we know, are focusing on children and adolescents. At this point, I'd like to introduce our wellbeing convener, Dr. Alan Shell. Dr. Shell served as a director of WALPA for some 20 years, which is the maximum allowable term, and is indeed our first life member of WALPA. Alan's been involved with the wellbeing program since its actual inception, which was around 15 years ago. And when Alan stood down from the board, we asked him if he would continue his leadership of our wellbeing program. And we were delighted that he agreed and to do so, <coughs> pardon me, and he's ably supported 
by Ruth Guth, our Community Partnership Officer, Michelle Stockley, our Marketing Manager, and Josephine Holland, the Chair of our Community Partnership Committee. So ladies and gentlemen, I really hope you enjoy this evening's discussions and I will now hand over to Dr. Alan Shell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard, for those kind words and support. Obviously, we're extremely fortunate to have a wonderful range of organisations that offer support at times like this. And I'm very proud to say that Walpa Jewish Hospital has been part of that community of support for over 60 years now. Uh, while Walpa provides the Jewish and general community with first-class post-operative rehabilitation, geriatric and palliative care services, it also supports many other worthwhile organisations through its own charitable foundation. Over these next three wellbeing events, focusing on issues around mental health, we will variously be partnering with other organisations such as Jewish House, Jewish Care, COA and Montefiore, who all provide our Jewish community with mental health support through their outreach and in-house services. Of course, there are other very well established and highly respected community support services such as Lifeline, Beyond Blue and Kids Helpline that are there when you or somebody else close to you needs them and for you to know that you are not alone. Anyway, enough from me, because we're gonna have some wonderful speakers here this evening. And back to our very favorite MC, Julie McCrossan. Thank you very much, Alan. And can I just say to everybody, Alan and I are, are used to being in a, in a great big theater in Bondi Junction with hundreds of people in front of us. And now we can only see a few people. And so what I would like to introduce, and even uh, I'm talking to everybody, we've got well over a hundred people already have joined us. Uh, this uh, action is clapping in the deaf community. So I would now like us all, I'd like to invite those people who are on the screen and people at home to just thank Alan Shell for all that service and for his work as a question moderator tonight. Thank you very much. And we'll be doing lots of clapping as we go along. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, our partner uh, tonight with this wonderful forum uh, is the Jewish House, the independent non-government service and uh, the CEO, Rabbi, Rabbi Mendel Costello AM, who has joined us before at these community wellbeing forums, is going to say some words. I'll just simply say, as we're talking about uncertainty and its impact on children and young people tonight, that Jewish House helps people uh, uh, of all ages at, in all sorts of crises and all sorts of need. And Rabbi Costello is a chaplain in many hospitals and schools, and he has experience in supporting people in all sorts of times of uncertainty. He's also currently a commissioner with the National Mental Health Commission. So if you could, without clapping, welcome the rabbi to say some words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here and to be partnering once again with WALPA. Um, my relationship with WALPA goes back 30 years of uh, regular visits and uh, lots of different programs over the years. So. It's wonderful, once again, to be working closely with WALPA. I've been asked just to say a few words about Jewish House, what we're about, what we do, and a little bit what we've been doing in uh, these uncertain times with COVID. So Jewish House is a crisis organization. We sort of like to uh, describe it a little bit like the emergency room in the welfare space, which means that we are very available. We've got a crisis line which operates 24 hours, seven days a week for people that are going through a crisis, um, whether it's um, suicide risk or whether it's accommodation or whether it's other kinds of um, difficult times, DV, whatever it may be. Um, so that's, the, you know, I guess the, the entry point and like in the case of an emergency room where it's very available. The other thing about an emergency room is that there's a lot of varied services that you can get very quickly and quite a lot of it, but short term. And therefore, the kind of services that we've got is we've got accommodation. So we've got um, 12 beds in our Flood Street site, but we now have over 80 beds in other sites um, working with the government and other programs to be able to have accommodation available. Some is emergency short-term accommodation, and there's some that subsidize longer-term sort of accommodation. We uh, also have a team of psychologists and we, do, we bulk build that psychology to make it more available. And as you would know, now with COVID, um, there's the opportunity to do that online as well. The telehealth 
So very important. Um, and, you know, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about um, psychology and the impact that it can have when people are struggling. Um, we also have a large team of case managers of social workers that are available and work across different programs to help people navigate all the different services that are out there and advocate for them. We also have uh, pastoral care is a strong part of what we do. And as part of that, we also have a chaplaincy program and hospital visits. So we probably see about 60 to 80 patients a week across the uh, different hospitals. We also support some of the people in nursing homes. Um, I'm the rabbi from Maccabi for Redham School, um, supporting us of BJE and many other organizations working closely with them. Um, we also have a more recent program, which is called the JH Kids, which is a program to, to um, support kids through different groups and um, programs and holiday programs. So you can look at our website to learn more about that. Um, more recently, in relation to COVID, we've looked at what are some of the urgent things that need to be done. And in doing that, we've set up a portal on our website that's got lots of different uh, activities and programs that can support you um, and lots of different resources. So recently, we've put up a calendar that you can work with your kids to be able to set a calendar for the day and um, drop in different things. You want to go for a tour of the zoo or you like craft, and you've got a whole range of different crafts. You like dance, different dance opportunities, cooking different cooking opportunities. So you can actually slot all those things into that, into that calendar. Uh, we did a lot of work before Pesach, making sure that uh, people in hospitals and nursing homes across um, Sydney, the ride of Sydney, have got matzah and grape juice, which was a real challenge, particularly with COVID, to make sure that everybody got that and got it through the doors. Um, one of the other interesting challenges is people staying in hotels, um, particularly for Pesach, to be able to, with quarantine, to be able to get matzo and wine through, which was a real challenge. And I'm happy to say that uh, more recently, we've now organized kosher food that will flow through there. Um, we also worked with um, pharmacy to be able to have pharmacy. We also set up a strong psychology. So we have probably around 30 psychologists and um, counselors that are available for brief sessions. But the idea is to introduce people more to counseling and psychology and then if they need it to be able to make appointments and the um, psychologist in a more comprehensive way. With JH Kids, again, we've got different programs, but looking forward, some of the big issues that are, that are I think coming forward are obviously family relationships and some of the stresses that happen in relationships and giving families tools to be able to work through some of those stresses and also looking at jobs. And I think that's really being able to support people and provide people support with that, as you would have seen us from the National Mental Health Commission, lots of different programs that have been put through to be able to support people with their mental health. So there's lots of different things going on, but I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a peppering of what we do at Jewish House. You'll, you can see it on our website. Also to put in a little commercial for on the 25th of June, we've got a lunch with, um, or a Zoom lunch with uh, the health minister, Brad Hazard. So you, again, you'll be able to um, look out for that on our Facebook page and uh, online. But it's wonderful to be part of this wonderful session. So well done to Walpa. It's always wonderful to partner with you and great team of speakers tonight. So really looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And uh, I uh, should let people know there you can see information uh, on the screen about Jewish House and uh, number and so on, that amazing array of services that the rabbis just described. And I should let you know that uh, after this evening, all those people who've registered will be receiving an email that has a whole list of contact uh, websites and, uh, and information about resources. Because as I said at the beginning, welcome to those of you who've just joined us. Uh, our purpose tonight is to emphasize that it's absolutely normal uh, to feel a bit discombobulated, a bit shaky uh, in a time like this and to, uh, we've got a, a, a four people I'm about to introduce you to, all of them clinical psychologists, all of, all of them with extensive experience in uh, assisting people of all ages uh, with uncertainty and practical tools on how to uh, 
play our role as parents, grandparents, teachers and community leaders to, to bring a sense of safety and security, particularly to our young people. So just before I introduce our panel and they all pop up on our screen, uh, I just wanted to let you know that um, there's a few little bits of housekeeping. So the most important thing to say is that if you've joined us today as a member of the audience, your microphone is on mute and we don't have video. This Zoom is a webinar. It's not like Zoom that you may use if you're uh, in your workplace or other community organisations. So if you've joined us as an audience member, you are not able to speak or be seen. However, you can ask questions uh, through the Q&A function, uh, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. And those uh, questions will come up and we have a question moderator, Dr. Alan Shell, who we heard from earlier, uh, who will uh, look at the questions, hello there, follow the questions, and from time to time I will come to him in our discussion and ask him for questions uh, for our uh, guest speakers, our guest panel members. Um, also to emphasise that you can ask questions anonymously if you prefer or with your, your name. And again, if you're familiar uh, with Zoom, you will not be able to use the chat button. Uh, you will only be uh, coming in through the Q&A. And the final thing to just quickly say is that um, our apologies in advance if we don't get to all your questions, but we'll do our best. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me begin our, our discussion tonight on managing the mental health of your child or adolescent in the age of COVID-19. And I, I will just say the names of our four guests as they pop up, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them as I bring them into the conversation. Uh, so could I welcome Dr. Jodie Lowinger, uh, CEO and founder of the Sydney Anxiety Clinic, uh, Dr. Danielle Einstein, uh, who uh, is... Um, active and responsible for the Chilled and Considerate program, and we'll hear more about that. Dr. Zach Seidler, a clinical psychologist and researcher, as everybody is tonight, but uh, Zach is working with Vo uh, Movember and has a, a special interest uh, in distress as experienced uh, by uh, boys and men. And also Dee Fintinghoff, who works as a psychologist at Mariah College and has a particular focus on the senior years there and on positive psychology and positive emotions. So uh, welcome to you all. Could you all clap uh, wherever you are with, by waving your hands in that manner? <laughs> Thank you. And I'd like to begin by welcoming uh, Dr. Jody Lowinger, CEO and founder of the Sydney Anxiety Clinic. Just before I, I, I begin our conversation, just tell us a little bit about the Sydney Anxiety Clinic and, and what is offered there for people. Hi Julian, hi everyone. It's such a joy to be here and sharing wisdom amongst uh, family, friends, community. It's a real joy. Uh, so as CEO and founder of the Sydney Anxiety Clinic, we work with adults, kids and teens across all presentations relating to anxiety, stress, mood and behavioural challenges for all areas um, and for all ages. And so I do a lot of work in that space, helping parents to feel empowered with the tools and techniques to help their children and teens, as well as working with kids and teens directly. And the other hat that I wear is uh, in my work as a performance coach through my other organization, which is called Mind Strength. And uh, in that I'm a performance coach to school principals and to business leaders and uh, we work to build thriving school communities and thriving organisational communities as well. Just before I, I go into a bit more depth, tonight I'll be asking all the panel members to give us a sense of the age groups they're referring to in their, their comments. And I, I just, we tend to talk a lot about adolescents and teenagers, and yet I guess my question would be firstly, do you deal with young children? If so, how young? And to what degree are young children, even preschool children, affected at a time like this when the community uh, has a certain level of anxiety around COVID-19? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I certainly, I work with children, let's say from in utero, <laughs> in utero and all the way through. Um, so all ages and yes, absolutely preschoolers, you know, um, primary, high school, we are all ages are feeling the impact of the next level anxiety and distress that's taking hold within family units, 
and the global community. And really little ones, are, um, they come with their inherent temperament and uh, vulnerabilities, but also children are barometers of their environment. And really, you know, we're all in this together. We're all experiencing the stress and the anxiety to various levels of severity amidst the uncertainty and the challenges of the COVID context. And so when I'm working with parents and school leaders, it's really about how to ensure that you're nurturing and looking after yourselves, recognizing you can't pour from an empty glass. And so it's about helping yourself in order to then help your children and your adolescents or in the school community, your school students. That's very interesting. Uh, I, I know your one of your fundamental messages tonight is that we should feel hopeful and empowered because when you seek help for anxiety, it works. But just before I go to that, I, I feel there's an implication in what you've said that uh, the way to help preschool or young children is to ensure uh, that the parents or grandparents are addressing their own feelings and well-being so they don't transmit anxiety to the very young children. And are you similarly saying that when it comes to teachers and principals or indeed community leaders like the rabbi, like uh, our president of Walpa, Richard uh, Allen, that they're managing their feelings and, and, and uh, communicating stability, routine and calmness, that that is one of the ways we as a community settle down. Yeah, there's so much that uh, uh, is to say about what you're raising there, Julie. I mean, uh, part of one of the hats that I wear as a high performance coach to, to global CEOs, actually. And so really, in essence, we're all leaders. As, as adults in our community, we're leaders. And part of that courageous leadership is seeing to what extent can we absorb you know, the people who we are looking after absorb their stress and give out a sense of calm. However, there's another really important message here. And this is the message of what's called um, distress tolerance. And distress tolerance is really the story of resilience. It says that all feelings are okay. You know, we as parents, I'm a mother of three, we as parents, we're not robots and that's okay. So where we can really deliver powerful, positive and helpful messages to our children or our, our school community or our organizational community is saying that, you know what, this is hard at the moment. What we're going through is difficult stuff and it will bring up feelings and that's okay. That's part of being human. And so it's not about not having the feelings. It's about how can we respond to those feelings with helpful actions to seek out the help that we need, if that is the case, or to uh, communicate with one another, connect and look after each other, but embrace resilience strategies. So with the Mind Strength programs that I've built, there's a toolkit of resilience strategies, of mental health and well-being strategies within all of those various contexts. And the other key message that I uh, like to deliver when I'm working with um, you know, global communities at times or local communities is that um, anxiety is to a large degree, well, it is really part of our common human experience. And where anxiety tips into this, let's say more clinical anxiety is where it's causing prolonged fear, suffering and avoidance in a person's life, whether it's a preschooler, a teenager, or a primary schooler. But sorry, Julie, to get back to your question, the anxiety element is really helpable. So no need to suffer in silence when you can turn problems around fast. What I'd like to do, just before I come to that question of what should we look for in our young children or our adolescents that might mean they do have what I think is called clinical anxiety, and I think you use the expression there, prolonged fear, suffering and avoidance. I'd like to unpack that a little in a moment, but just before I come to that, you've indicated this notion that it's normal to feel anxious at this time, and there are strategies to nurture resilience. 
obviously you can't do your whole work in, in, a, in a little interview like this, but could you give us a couple of examples for parents and grandparents listening of what they can do to try and support the children and adolescents in their families to, to, to be resilient? Yeah, with absolute pleasure. I feel like I'm, I'm sort of pouring my heart out to the world at the moment to, to share strategies on scale. So it's an absolute joy to do that. Uh, really a toolkit, uh, a, a, a powerful, practical go-to that we can all embrace is when we're grappling with uncertainty, our mind will pummel us, worry will take us into the future. And that's what worry does. It's trying to build certainty in the uncertainty. But in essence, it just makes us feel more uncertain rather than less uncertain. So if we can start to notice when worry is taking hold, you know, and worry is bossing us around, let's say, see if you can bring yourself back to the present moment. Sometimes it's using your breath, long, slow out breath, bring yourself back to the present moment and try and tip your mindset from worry, which is typically focusing on our threats and focusing on all the things that are out of our control, back to problem solving. Problem solving is focusing on what can I bring into my control in the present moment? How can I build effort and efficacy around the things that are in my control in the present moment? Problem, solve is, problem solving is solution oriented. It's typically more focused on effort and building out an action plan in the present moment. Um, so uh, it's really something that we can feel empowered around to utilize that mini practical strategy. And it could be a breathing exercise. It could be going for a walk, going for a swim, talking to a friend. That's a personal strategy. What I'm hearing from you, Jody, is that one of the ways we can help our children and our, our adolescents is to help ourselves. And it's not necessarily what we're saying, it's, it's modeling uh, self-knowledge and self-management. Is, is that something of what you're saying? It absolutely is. It's, mo it's modeling that, it's being a role model of resilience. And then the most powerful thing, parents have got a magnificent opportunity, particularly in this COVID context, to connect with your children and your preschoolers and your teenagers. So seeking out the opportunities to connect is invaluable. And sometimes you've got to pick your moments. Um, oftentimes bedtime is a precious opportunity to do that and help to uh, empower your children and your teenagers by validating their emotions. That is checking in, acknowledging their emotions and asking open-ended questions with your end goal in mind. So if you want your children or your teenager to feel better, let's say they've got a problem that they're experiencing, you can say, what do you think you can do to help yourself with this particular situation? And that opens the discussion. So it facilitates, it's a facilitation role that moves your children to feeling empowered in creating the solutions, but then it's collaboration as well. So in this context, when we've been in a home environment, uh, for me, it's been, it has absolutely been one of the silver linings is have, having had these opportunities to connect with my children. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think this quick, uh, issue of listening, not telling is going to come through <laughs> a lot tonight. Yes. Look, I, I want to ask you one more thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, in, invite another panel member in. Uh, and I, I just want to note, uh, I was uh, affected by what uh, Rabbi Castell said earlier to the issue of employment. And I'm thinking this isn't just an era of um, uncertainty in the sense of free floating global anxiety over uh, you know, the dangers of this COVID-19, it, it, we've also got this immensely significant economic effect. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that uh, there are many people in the Jewish community who are not well off and for whom this will be an economic experience. And I'm thinking, you know, that's another challenge for parents and grandparents, isn't it? That if they are having some financial struggles to try not to let that bleed into the children, that must be a very mm -hmm. hard thing to do, not to make the children aware of it. It is, it is very hard and because perceived anxiety is our perception of threat, anxiety is the fight or flight. And in the COVID context, to 
uh, a substantial degree, it has been real threat. You know, there's been threat to livelihood around the world, but there's been also threat to our very lives in various places around the world. So some people more vulnerable than others. But um, I suppose what this has tipped into, if I can bring it back to, let's say, the, the, the Sydney Anxiety Clinic and our capacity to extend reach, as, as Rabbi Castell was saying, the beautiful capacity to extend reach to all sectors of the community. So um, at, at Sydney Anxiety Clinic, what we were able to do, uh, we were moving in this direction, but COVID enabled us to build a hybrid uh, level of clinical care. And what I mean by hybrid is being able to offer not just face-to-face -face therapy, but exactly as we're doing now, technologically driven uh, video conferencing therapy, which hasn't impacted our capacity to help people. In fact, it has absolutely supercharged our capacity to help people. And so whoever it is, whatever you're going through, uh, we live in such a wonderful, wonderful society where there are next level services available. So please, please, please do not suffer in silence. We've got to break down stigma and uh, seek out the help that you need. And one thing that I love to say for people who experience anxiety, typically, I consider myself so exceptionally grateful for the opportunity to work with people who experience anxiety because there's this depth of thinking and depth of feeling, a beautiful level of care and this analytical mind. So I like to say you care because you care if you experience anxiety. Well, uh, Dr. Jodie Lowinger from the Sydney Anxiety Clinic, I come back to you a little bit later for that more clinical anxiety. I think that's a marvellous introduction and welcome uh, to anyone who's joined us uh, while Jodie was speaking. Uh, we're having a conversation hosted by Walpur Jewish Hospital and also Jewish House, talking about managing the mental health of our children and adolescents in this period of COVID-19 with a, a strong focus on uh, talking about uh, practical things we can do as parents and as teachers, as grandparents and as community leaders and, and uh, the sources of help that are in the community. I'd like to invite in now, if I may, Dr. Zach Seidler, who's also a clinical psychologist and researcher, very involved with uh, Movember, uh, and he has a special interest in distress for boys and men. So welcome to you, Zach, and I look forward to seeing your face and others seeing your face shortly. Zach, just first of all, what's Movember? Just so we people understand what that's about. For sure. Well, despite my current bearded look, um, come the month of November, that will all be shaved off and I will just be growing that disgusting upper lip situation, which <laughs> my uh, extended family loves to rip on me for. Um, we're a global men's health charity. Um, it began in 2002 with a couple of mates um, starting a, a competition for who could grow the best moustache. And we're now in 120 countries and we raise over $100 million a year for men's health, prostate cancer, testicular cancer, and mental health and suicide prevention. Okay, thank you. Uh, look, I want to come straight to this. I think we've had a, you know, a marvellous introduction uh, from Jody, And I guess I want to come to you with that sense of, uh, as someone with both a, a son and a daughter in my life, what are some of the special characteristics of many men? I suppose everyone's on a spectrum, men and boys, but do young, uh, uh, young male children, young boys and adolescent boys, do you feel that they can express their distress in particularly masculine ways? And I think you feel that we don't always recognise them. Could you speak to that, please? For sure, thank you. So I think that the idea around what masculinity is is something that lots of people uh, rely on certain stereotypes um, around, you know, stoicism and strength and self-reliance. And in many contexts, those are helpful. And in many contexts, they're actually quite hindering when it comes to our mental health. Um, but when we talk specifically about the way that boys are brought up and the idea that they can or cannot express their emotions, um, excuse my French, but I, I call bullshit on the fact that, um, that boys cannot express their distress. They just so happen to do it often in very different ways um, and in ways that often our society 
um, condones or, or, sorry, rather than condones, views as bad behavior, I would say in many instances. And so we end up with, uh, rather than your typical anxiety, which gets diagnosed, which, which Jody was just talking about before, um, which is that idea around, around threat and hypervigilance to, to um, threat and having that idea around, you know, uh, your heart rate going up or, or panic attacks, that type of, uh, that type of thing. In fact, we, we often see in, in boys that their distress, their anxiety gets bottled up and actually manifests in externalizing symptoms, which is to say they act out, um, which is why we have um, boys being suspended from school at much higher rates. We have incarceration rates um, of, of young boys in, in juvenile detention through the roof. Um, and that's why you see d disorders like ADHD and uh, oppositional defiance disorder, um, the prevalence rates amongst boys are, are much higher than, than in girls. I would posit that underlying much of those behaviors is a cry for help in many instances and is uh, a form of anxiety that we are misrepresenting and misunderstanding. And Zach, can I just ask you, do you think, well, everything you've just said is equally true for the Jewish community as it may be for the broader community. You know, are there cultural differences here? I would say that overall, um, that it's largely the same regardless of, of cultural upbringing. It depends, I guess, the way that uh, the Jewish community is going to view bad behaviour. I don't think we have a, a history of having um, young boys from Mariah going to, to juvie, thankfully. Um, I don't, I don't know many. So I would say that our, our behavior on the whole and our community is very good at looking after one another, which means that that bad behavior, rather than necessarily being punished in ways that it is in other communities, we pick each other up. And of course, the Jewish community itself is so diverse too, isn't it? That's an important thing to hold on to at a moment like this, isn't it? Exactly. You know, the, the, the image of the young Jewish man, uh, boy who's studious and uh, on the way to law or medicine, that's just not true for every Jewish boy. I'm not saying it isn't for a lot, but not everyone. Exactly. Exactly. So listen, what, we, we spoke earlier today and I was very impressed by your reflections on the importance of good uh, masculine role models, the notion of good fathers, good male mentors who are listeners and adapters and flexible in terms of helping young boys and men. Could you speak to that and perhaps give us examples of the kind of things that fathers, grandfathers, rabbis, teachers can be doing to particularly help boys and, uh, and adolescent men? Definitely. I think that when, when it comes down to it, male mentorship is at the core of healthy masculinity. Um, positive mentors um, are few and far between, sadly. I would just say, having just done a uh, little audit of the participants here tonight, um, I would commend all of the women in the audience, but it looks like there's at least 100 women and not many more than 10 men. Um, that is the case everywhere I go. Every woman jumps on board and wants to help the boys and the men in their lives. Um, and men, sadly, are not doing enough, I would say, in many instances, at showing their ability to be caregivers, at showing their compassion and their empathy, which is innate to all of us. And, you know, I see endless numbers of men, of fathers who, who I treat, of, of young boys um, who have such depth of feeling um, and who suppress it in many instances. So I would say we really need to, to call out the guys in our lives. And we know for, across the, the spectrum, from white ribbon, you know, and, and domestic violence um, to the Me Too movement all the way into Movember, where we try to get men on board to make moves, to early intervene and, and change behaviour um, by being those positive role models, having those conversations that are real and meaningful and connecting with those in their lives. If we have a father who shows no emotion, who describes, you know, no insight into his own experience, um, how is a boy supposed to grow up believing that that's what a man does? Um, obviously, having someone external is really useful. And you often hear if someone doesn't have a father who, who does that, they often rely on a community um, support network to provide that type of mentorship. But it would be really great if we can grow with a, a new generation of boys and men who have these values of masculinity, which are entwined with you know, emotional um, capacity, altruism, and, and belief in their ability to uh, make change. You know, I, I, 
I, I, I listen to what you're saying and yet there's a part of me that says, while they're so admirable and I'm hoping that my heavily pregnant 28 year old daughter whose uh, husband turns out to be the man you describe and I think there's every hope. But he, I also know that he's one of a, a family of men who never seem more comfortable than when they're doing two things. One is they're watching, in this case, AFL, they're in Adelaide, and they're all together watching look in a line, looking straight ahead, talking in immense detail about a ball game. And the only other time they look really, really relaxed is when they're kicking a ball, when they're playing with ball. And I'm, I'm honestly not meaning to stereotype, but it's just true. And, it's, mm -hmm. and so for men who know that this is an international crisis of some history. This is probably the biggest thing since the Second World War, isn't it? And I say I that to you say Sliced bread, but sure. Yeah, you know, it's big. It's a world pandemic. It's, we haven't got the vaccine. Our children have had their education disrupted. This is quite big. So for current fathers and grandfathers who may not yet feel comfortable doing what uh, uh, Jody so well described, the open-ended question at bedtime and the listening, are there some strategies you can offer so that they can help boys right now? Do it in your own way. That idea that, that your uh, son-in-law is really good at being calm and connected when he's at the footy, that is a perfect time to have these conversations. The idea of having face-to-face -face conversations, mothers are really good at that, at having those with their, with their kids. But we know that uh, when you're driving to school and looking in the rear view mirror might be the best time to have a conversation with your son uh, because sadly boys are socialized to not necessarily be that comfortable in those conversations but they have the capacity so you know finding the right times where they are their most comfortable where they are able to describe and express things in ways that are meaningful to them don't just expect that somebody's going to cry in front of you don't expect that somebody is going to share and pour their heart out to you that's not necessarily what's needed either we can support each other in instrumental ways and that's what masculinity is really about and we can leverage that, which is to say that going and kicking a footy with your mate and having that time with them and talking about whatever it may be is going to be a really meaningful conversation. It doesn't need to fit within a box of what we describe as emotional communication and connection. So do it in your own way and, and really it's just a matter of going, what are my strengths here and how can I rely on those to look after the, the men in my life? When we did speak though, you said it's about listening, not telling what to do. Why is that so important? That's I, I thought maybe you were advising with the wife, but you mean with the children. I do, but the idea around, the idea around um, listening is that we tell men and boys especially to open up more, um, but are we ready to listen? I guess is really what's important here. You can't continue to perpetuate this idea that everyone needs to talk when you don't listen to the way that they're expressing their distress. You need to adapt. We need to open our ears differently. Um, because for instance, when a boy is at school and is mucking up as I did, I believe my mother is on this call and she will attest to that. Um, I Thankfully, I came home and we had conversations about it rather than being reprimanded. And I think that that's what's really important or I wouldn't be here today. So it's really a matter of adapting and, and finding ways, inroads, I guess, to talking about that behaviour and to finding mechanisms of change rather than um, stifling progress. I, I'm so sorry, as I said earlier, that people who've joined as the audience are not able to speak uh, uh, or be seen, but you can ask questions and I'll be coming in a moment to uh, Dr. Alan Fell with some questions. I, I'm sorry in a way because I would love now to cross to your mother and just, you know, do a little bit of a fact check on thank everything. You. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much, Zach Seidler. And I will, uh, as I indicated to Jody, I'll come back to that question of suicide prevention, that harder end, a little bit later. But uh, if you've just joined us, we've heard from two of our speakers, Dr. Jody Lowinger from the uh, Sydney Anxiety Clinic and Dr. Zach Seidler from Movember, one of the four clinical psychologists and researchers we have for you tonight as we look at helping our, our children and adolescents in this time of uh, COVID-19. And Dr. Alan Shell has been monitoring the questions. Alan, have you got some questions that I'll put to Jack and uh, Zoe, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, Jody and Zach at this point, and then I'll bring in our other two members. Thank you, Alan. Uh, yes, I think one for Jody, which is very good, is how do you relieve the anxiety of my sensitive 13-year-old son who's thrown by this huge volume of change and has now become more anxious? 
Yeah, beautiful question. And so really it comes back to building awareness around uh, what's going on for um, the, the sun and uh, what, is, what are the worry thoughts that are taking hold? What is the worry story? And that can tip us into this fight or flight sense of responding to that worry with a feeling of real threat when it's in fact perceived threat. And so understanding anxiety, understanding what it is, is really helpful and building awareness around the thoughts, around the feelings and around the behaviors that we typically engage in because of that is the essence of um, the, the early stage of success and awareness being, okay, I'm feeling, I'm feeling anxious, so I'm going to avoid, right? And that's, what the, that's the flight in the fight or flight, just as an example. Or I'm going to get really angry and agitated. And so many faces of anxiety, helping then to engage in resilience strategies. So how to build in a pause between situation and how the child responds to that situation is very powerful, very helpful. And there's many very variations to that uh, stopping, taking a slow out breath, bringing, uh, helping the child to engage in the present moment. But really validating the emotions again is such an important thing to help your child to recognize again, coming back to, to this beautiful, I think it was 13 year old that you said, your sweetheart cares because he cares, right? This beautiful analytical mind, this kind, caring heart. That is the typical personality or temperament of anxiety. And so relish those beautiful qualities, but recognize it is a double-edged sword. So we embrace the strengths and we engage in resilience and anxiety management strategies to stand up to the challenges. Okay, so following on from that, I've got one for Zach then. Um, how do we then tell the difference between perhaps normal sadness and boredom and a teenage boy and perhaps bordering on some sort of mental health issue? Ask. Um, Ask. I think there's, there's a lot to be said for uh, sitting down and having a conversation. There's, there's this idea that everyone should just be reading everyone's mind. Um, finding the right time and having those conversations with the person and I think that having it with a boy especially um, and setting up I guess and having potentially as I said before having the father sit down and admit his own issues that he's been through because let's be honest no one gets through this life without them as Jody said um, would be a really useful uh, ability to reciprocate and, and to show that um, this is not weakness and then potentially to also um, walk through what treatment you know is coming to see a psychologist actually looks like and how brave and courageous that can be. It's not a weakness, um, you know, seeking out and trying to find insight and, and skills to, to grow strength rather than deal with weakness, I guess. Okay, back to you, Julie. Thank you so much, Alan. And, and, and the, the theme that just emerged there was this notion of help seeking. And I, I'd like to come, if I may, next to uh, the third member of our panel, Dee Fittinghoff, who works at Mariah College, uh, where she focuses particularly on the senior years and on positive psychology, positive emotions. Uh, so Dee, uh, welcome to you. And, and first of all, as Dee comes, let's clap Zach and Jody for the contribution that they've already made. Thank you. It's quite a pleasant thing. So Dee, can you come on and, and, and just to, to begin, tell us what your role is at, uh, at Mariah. Oh, well, thanks so much. Such a wonderful opportunity to work with all these lovely people um, and to share what we do at Mariah with the community and hopefully give them some really wonderful tips um, because everything that we do well-being is at the heart of every program that we have. It's who we are. And so the well-being of our students is of absolute importance, especially during this time. And um, one of the things that we do is run a lot of different kinds of well-being programs at the school because there's a very strong correlation between well-being and mental health. Okay, and well-being sort of comes under the whole umbrella of positive psychology, which focuses on the science of how do we help people to flourish? What can we do to help people to flourish and to cope, especially over these kind of, you know, challenging times? And so 
I love the um, Institute of Positive Education, what they say about well-being, because what does well-being really mean, you know? And, and what it, 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 it looks at feeling good and doing good. And feeling good is about helping people to engage with positive emotion. Um, Jody mentioned that quite a bit, you know, very important to have meaning in their life, to have strong relationships, to feel a sense of accomplishment and a sense of optimism. Those are all really important things for um, students, for families. And then when you feel good, then you do good. And do good is about practicing kindness and gratitude and all of that. Well, you've given us a marvellous introduction, but before I go further, I would like to share with the, the people who've joined us uh, uh, for this uh, community forum with the fact I think you're in your son's bedroom and you think we're not in your lounge room. You don't have the Israeli flag just around the house and we are looking at what's on his bedroom wall. I thought it would, you know what, his bedroom's like at the back of the house, so it's away. I thought hopefully my dogs won't bark and there won't be, you know, all my kids. Are, um, and it just happened to be, there it is. I thought it was really um, appropriate for tonight. I, I think it's shamelessly uh, building uh, 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 communication with the audience. It's fantastic. Look, uh, we, we spoke earlier today and I'd just like to run through some of these terms because mm -hmm. uh, for those who've joined us, we're very much uh, wanting to focus on the fact that it is normal for our children and indeed ourselves to feel a bit disorientated, a bit anxious uh, with the pressures of COVID-19, both economic and, and in health terms. But there is uh, many sources of support within the community and, and positive things we can do. And what I, I said to you, I wanted to uh, hear from you, what would be your advice to parents and grandparents? And one of the things you said was the aeroplane message. Can you just explain what that is and how it might help? Absolutely. I think we've all forgotten what it's like to be on an aeroplane because no one's been, you know, but when they say on aeroplanes, uh, you know, that you should put your own oxygen mask on if you need it and then your child, I think there's a very important message there for all of us psychologically and that is, if you're okay, then your child is okay. And I think Jody already said, you know, a little bit about that. And I want to just reiterate and, and you know, build on that because I think it's very important what positive emotion is about is it's not to say that everything always has to be you know rainbows and happiness and all positive it's actually acknowledging with your child and i'm specifically talking with teens but you can do this with children of all ages obviously developmentally in an appropriate way um, but it's acknowledging with your child, you know what, this is a really scary time. And sometimes it's been really difficult and hard for us. And sometimes we actually are unsure about what's going to happen. Mm. But, and this is where the positive emotion comes in. But you know what, we're all in this together. We are here to support you. We're here to listen to you. We've got great leaders at our school, in our community, and we are going to get through this together and that we do know so that you are giving kids a sense of hope and optimism, but also acknowledging that this is a really difficult time. And is part of that uh, airplane image, you know, you put the oxygen on yourself before you put it on the child, which must be in practice. Uh, I've often thought it would actually be quite a hard thing to do if you ever were on a plane and that happened. Your instinct is to help the child. But, 100%. but um, you know, is part of that with one's own friends or peers, uh, advisors, to deal with the avalanche? I mean, many of us care deeply about the United States and what's happening that there now is very disconcerting. Mm -hmm. I, I happen to be, uh, my mother was a, a Londoner and to see England apparently not handling COVID-19 very well, I find personally very painful. I, 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 Israel is in a turbulent state at the moment. So there are many external factors in the news and our children through social media and television and so on absorb that. Do we need to deal with our own feelings about that so we can then speak in a calm manner with our children? Is that Absolutely. part of it? Absolutely, 100%. And I think that is where mindfulness, which is a part of positive emotions and positive psychology, is so helpful. Because what it does, and I call it when I teach it in, in classes to our senior students, I call it practicing the cause, okay? That instead of, that, that I teach them pause before you judge, pause before you assume, pause before you react, 
okay? Have that moment just to think things through before you um, react or respond. And what is the difference between that? Responding is about thinking things through and responding in a calm, measured, safe, appropriate way? Or do you just react blindly, you know, and shoot from the hips? I think it's very, very important. And Jody mentioned it as well um, about mindfulness, just being very mindful of present moment breathing so that you can do that. And when uh, uh, Dr. Fell asked the question about the 13 year old, there was a, uh, I think it was in that context, the issue of uh, encouraging help seeking. Can you tell us a little bit about what the sort of messages are you, you're discussing with the children at Mariah? And do you mention specific services or is it more a general approach? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I think that help seeking behavior is, is one of our huge goals. And so what we've done, like as for, for myself and, you know, as a high school psychologist, my office is actually in the middle of the high school so that I'm visible to all the students. It's not around, you know, the back or whatever, so that students feel like they can pop in, they can talk to me, they can get support. And we, we, we say to them all the time, very much messages what Jody and Zach have you know, already said, that you are not alone in this. You do not have to be alone. Whatever you are going through, we acknowledge that different people will have different feelings and that's okay. Come and talk to us. And then what we do is we can then refer on, we do a lot of support, crisis intervention, but we refer on to other psychologists in the community often to you know, continue the work. And we support at school and we support their well-being. Um, the other thing that we, that we do, and we, we've sent out um, a lot of infographics over this time, which are, you know, sort of um, pictures of how people can seek help. And some of the online tools that we've given to them in our community, what unbelievable and amazing help there is with Jewish House. We heard from Rabbi Castell with yeah. Jewish Care. And there are beautiful online tools for teenagers, um, such as Smiling Mind, which is a mindfulness tool, such as Brave Online, which is a beautiful online tool for anxiety, um, the Mood Gym, which is for anxiety and depression, Reach Out, you know, the list is endless. Um, and so we, we do, we give that a lot to our students so that they can go, Headspace is another example, they can go as well and they can have at school and externally, they've got support. Look, I'd just like to ask you two quick things, if I may, and then I'll bring in our final panellist uh, and, and come back to Dr. Shell for some more questions. But you mentioned this focus on, on positive psychology, on strengths. Could you speak a bit to helping children of whatever age, uh, because obviously we're not just talking about adolescents here, mm -hmm. to identify for themselves I guess what I would call self-soothing activities. I don't know what you would call them, but the things that they know help them when they're feeling upset and reminding and encouraging them. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. I think one of the biggest things that can be so helpful is what we call the locus of control. Okay. So having kids actually look at, okay, what can I control in the situation? And what are the things that are beyond my control. So for example, in a COVID, you know, kind of situation, um, what are the things that we cannot control? We don't know how long this is going to go on for. We, 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 don't, we can't control actions of others, but what we can control is how our responses, we can control how we practice um, hygiene and, you know, social distancing. And a perfect example was when kids were on, on our Bayachad um, online program, and we said to, to the kids, this is a very different kind of situation for you. And we don't know how long we're going to be on this program. And we don't know how, but what we do know is that you can show up every single day and you can get dressed and you can have a workspace and you can engage in all your lessons. And those are the things that you can control. And so we try to help kids to work on um, what, what is in their control because it helps them to soothe, as you said, really helps them to feel like, I can actually do something about this and the things I can't control, I can just, you know, put on hold kind of thing for a while. Look, Dee, thank you so much. Dee Fittinghoff, uh, who works at Mariah College. That was absolutely marvellous. If we could give her uh, a clap in the deaf fashion. And uh, I'd love now to welcome our final panellist this evening, Dr. Danielle Einstein, uh, who has a great interest 
in managing uncertainty, another clinical psychologist and researcher, uh, and very involved with the Chilled and Considerate program, uh, which has been adapted as specifically, as I understand it, uh, to deal with COVID-19. And there is also a website involved. So if I could welcome Danielle and ask her if she could, just to give us a snapshot of the Chilled and Considerate program, uh, just to kick us off, please. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me and hello everyone. Um, it's really an honour to be part of this um, presentation with these wonderful clinical psychologists. Um, the Children Considerate Program actually puts together the concepts that everyone's been talking about into a one hour program for parents to be able to do online and to be able to access wherever they are that you can come on and off it um, as you please. Um, but it also, it comes from my work and many years of research and not just mine, but also international research on how we respond to uncertainty. Because as Jody was saying, and as Dee's been talking about and Zach, there are some things that we know about the way that people um, respond to uncertainty. And what we hope to achieve, and we've got about 10,000 students doing it in Australia, in Hong Kong, um, and it's being run in the UK as well. Um, and we're getting students and teachers to learn exactly what happens to them when they're facing uncertainty and to have a language to be able to talk about what's happening, talk about what's happening in their mind, talk about what's happening in their feelings and then know the steps to take to manage that uncertainty. And it's exactly in line with what Dee was talking about and what Jody was talking about. Um, the only difference I would say in all that is that when I talk about how we respond to uncertainty, I like to talk about how we always think people hear about anxiety as being a big reaction because we've had so much awareness about mental health and about um, and focus on that in our schools and in our communities that we think anxiety, big fight or flight, but actually uncertainty does something a bit different to us. It just gives us a little reaction, a small reaction in our body that we don't like very much. And most of us spend our time in our thoughts and we ignore the feelings in our body and we try and get out of the, the situation very quickly. And that leads us to do irrational things like some of that panic shopping that we saw. Um, and so it, if you can think about uncertainty in that way, and then we draw on the things that Dee and Jody were talking about, we can come up with this language and the skills. And I really want everybody in Australia to learn these skills, whether you're a parent, whether you're a grandparent, whether you're a student, I think now is the most amazing opportunity. I know it's scary, but it's a great opportunity. And I know, uh, Danielle, you have many things you would like to talk about and, and we can only do a fraction of them now. So just a few of the key ideas that we discussed earlier today together is this notion that um, you can look upon the, as well, crisis is a big word, but the, the instability, the uncertainty generated by COVID-19, whether it be an anxiety about health or economic situation, you can look upon it as an opportunity to learn new skills, to learn how to manage. And I suppose my one thought there is not everybody's going to do chilled and considerate program not everybody's going to go to the sydney anxiety clinic or go to the november website and to the degree that or, or have the opportunity of of uh, of, of, of Dee's, uh, uh, work at mariah or am i uh, so what i was going to say to you are there one or two things we can share with people as strategies or am i wrong do we do we should we be saying clinical psychologists no, you can't just wing this. You actually, to do right by your children and your, your uh, students, you need to do some structured work about this. What, what would be your response, Danielle? I do think we need to take at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and then practice these little skills, which Dee and Zach and Jodie would know, don't take us long to put in practice at the time. They Give just us two specifics okay so we talk about little what if bombs which is when you're facing an uncertainty in an important situation or just uncertainty now it's finances it's been health we think you know for, for our students let's think about our teenagers because that's what this topic is what if i drop a class in maths now that i'm back at school and i might have missed some of the online learning or just been distracted by chats what if i'm going to what what if i don't get an atar because of the disruptions to the hsc what if my mum gets sick these sorts of things are these what if bombs and what happens is when we get really 
into them and we do as parents as well as as students and they rummage around the back of our mind unfortunately they multiply we just get more and more okay so what do we do so we need to first of all we can sort of staple ourselves by thinking about when am i going to know the answer to this what if bomb that's one of the first things right because we always want to rush to the answer it disturbs us but i think the other thing that comes even before that that jody was talking about is we need to be a detective and we need to recognize that we have that what if bomb and we need to actually then write it down and work through a couple of logical steps with it and that's that's the really important learning for all of us um, to have right now um, Shall I stop, Julie, and then... Well, could you give me... Uh, I, just to finish that, we, we, you know, what I think I'm hearing you say is that one of the um, things that can happen in a time of uncertainty is that our fears run around in our heads. And, and I mean, to be honest with you, as someone who did get a, a tummy ache during the HSC, and this was 1971, it was a lot more stable back then. And I went to a school that had matron and we got to know each other. I have been thinking about poor kids who are doing year 12 right now. I think that's a pretty tough gig. And, and I think the concern that your mum might get sick, your dad might get sick or lose their job. I mean, these are quite substantial concerns. So if we were trying to help ourselves to manage our fears so we could model calmness to the children, what are you saying we do if we have those concerns so we stop it running around and we don't look anxious in front of the kids? So we, we do need to understand what our own reaction is first, as everybody has been saying. And what, what I like to think about is it's emotion regulation and it's the idea of a wave. Um, and... There, there, if we talk about those what ifs for a second, in terms of things that I can give people right now, Julie, for instance, financial loss has been a very big problem and worry for many, many families. It's come up in the UNICEF report last week and many of our students are still walking around with those at the back of their mind because families will have let it seep out a little way, okay? Because it's very hard not to talk about it when, we're, when it's a big issue and we're trying to convey to our children that it's really serious, the lockdown's important, we're shaken up, we need to make some changes. And then parents might have worked through their own what if worries, but they haven't actually shared the new resolution with their children. And they're not aware that that's at the back of the mind, adding on to the worries about work and schoolwork, et cetera, is also this point. So, so when we have corrective information in and we know what is actually now, the situation has changed a bit. We do need to, and if we've done what Zach was talking about in terms of checking in and understanding what's happening in our children's minds and just listening, there are times when we can actually provide the corrective information. Yep. And, and now that's different to providing reassurance, which I'll just talk about later if you want me to. Uh, uh, that notion of corrective information, that we, we've, had a, we've got a situation where our media and our community are full of both accurate and inaccurate information, mm -hmm and uncertainty, genuine uncertainty, so that big things are changing in the understanding of experts within a week. So it is a time of genuine uncertainty. So is what you're saying is that where you can help your children to identify inaccuracy, you can, mm. but that really you're saying, look, we are dealing together as a family and as a community with ongoing uncertainty, but we love you, you have a home, <laughs> you know, give, give those sort of stability messages. Is, is that part of what you're saying? But just keep listening, talking, open-ended questions. We're in it together. And, and it's about um, providing encouragement for them when they're struggling, but not providing that reassurance and not answering. The whole point about uncertainty and those what-if thoughts is we don't know. We don't know what score you're going to get in the maths test. We don't know whether you're going to get into the university course and I don't know whether mum is going to get sick. Now, the likelihood is now that mum isn't going to get sick because we really have got good things in place. Yes. Um, but the, the problem is, as a community, and basically the, what feeds anxiety and what makes anxiety worse and turns it into clinical anxiety is when our children lean on us to give, us, to give them reassurance all the time. So when we say, no, no, it's all going to be okay, 
that's actually not the right message to give. We can give the message of we are in it together and we will work through it together, but we don't want to take away the child's learning of how to manage worry and how to sit with uncertainty, which is what we're trying to teach in the program. Yeah. Um, and, we, and we don't want to take away, again, similarly, if we're dealing with anxiety, so when worry does feed anxiety and it will feed depression as well, we don't want to take away the child's ability to work through the problems themselves and see that they can manage. So we've got to support and we can, we can scaffold and support the help that we're giving our children, but we don't want to take the problem away because we're feeling uncomfortable because we don't like the fact that they're unhappy. So that means the first step is to understand, and I think this is what everybody's been saying today, if we have to first understand how we get affected by uncertainty and learn our own structured method to manage that. And then when our children unsettle us and we start to have worries because they've told us that they're not feeling good or, or we're getting an email from school saying they haven't kept up and they're, 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 the school's concerned about them, we don't react to our worry. We're able to sit quietly and then, and then listen and, and help, as Zach said, them work their problems through. And they're using us as a sounding board, but we're not solving it for them and we certainly can't do it for them and certainly not if they're teenagers. Danielle Einstein, thank you so much. Uh, so much to think about here. What I would like to do, Alan, just before I come to you for a, a last couple of questions, is just ask one quick question of Jody and Zach that is just hanging over. I'm desperately hoping you can't hear my cavoodle barking in the background. If necessary, I will go and do something. But could I just come to you, Jody, for a moment? Because my one concern is that we focused a lot uh, on the adolescent. And I just want to get one comment from you about the preschool or younger child. And as a parent, I was always told routine is important, um, that structure and routine can be enormously helpful for children of all ages, but particularly for the young, mealtime, bedtime, and so on. Any observations for the very young child who is picking up on uncertainty so we help them to feel safe and secure? Uh, for the little one, um, it, it, it actually is very similar messages to what has been for older children and uh, adolescents is helping them to learn about emotions, helping them to recognise that, that emotions are okay. So really to be a, a coach as parents, an emotion coach um, is such a beautiful role that we have. And so it is about helping your child to label emotions, to recognize emotions in one another. And so it's building a concept around feelings. And the beautiful thing about that is when uh, or building a vocabulary around feelings, even if they're really little, where we have a vocabulary around feelings, we can start to recognize that our feelings go up and down gradually, and it's not this all or nothing thing. So that's what builds the early development of emotional regulation or emotional control. Where we have a concept, we can understand that it's not this all or nothing thing. So that's really powerful. And then we can move towards, okay, given these emotions, what can you do or what can we do together to stand up to those big or little or average sized emotions that are taking hold? Um, and uh, and this, this is one of the reasons this is super important for our little ones is because in this digitized world that we are in, um, but, you know, prior to COVID, let alone the supercharged digital world that we're in at the moment. Um, what happens is children are holding iPads and iPods and iPhones, little ones, infants, before they can walk and talk. And so it's undermining our capacity for emotional reciprocity, for eye contact. And we have to build emotional intelligence from a really young age and compensate for this digital era that we're in. And as parents, to feel empowered in that role is such a beautiful thing and a really important role that is. Thank you, thank you so much. And it's, that's why I think I want to do this. I am a person who, I want to touch you and feel the warmth. I like live theater. So <laughs> I, I understand what you're saying. Zach, because I, 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 I want to have time for one or two questions, but 
you mentioned something when we spoke earlier today that for some young men, some boys, the lockdown's actually been great at, because for a whole lot of reasons and going back to school is hard where for many children the structure of school and having access to people like Dee will be very helpful. Could you just speak to that? Sure, and I can see Danielle nodding, so I'm, I'm guessing that she's, she's witnessed this as well. Um, but plenty of my clients who have um, been diagnosed with ADHD, rightly or wrongly, um, have actually been showing you know, that they're flourishing in this time and the constraints of school and the, the structure that's imposed on sitting there for 45 minutes at a time and listen to me now and go and do this and go and do that. Um, they like to break rules. And so when the rules kind of get thrown out, thrown out the window, um, that freedom actually allows them to pursue their creativity and their ability to actually um, thrive uh, really shines through. And, and so I think that we need to take something, uh, you know, we always talk about a silver lining here. And I think that there are plenty of opportunities um, to be jumping on here and, and finding ways for some of those students when they come back to have a discussion with them around how it went and, and what potentially was really helpful and what, what hindered their learning as well. Um, but assuming that this was a crap time for everyone, I think is, is not the right way uh, to look at it. This, again, that, that critical question, critical uh, message about open-ended question and, and listening. But I just thought that was such an interesting point. I, I'd like to come to you, Alan, if I may, our question moderator, and let's try and do two or three quick questions and answers before we close our meeting. But can we all just give a, a clap to each other? Because that was just a very wonderful series of comments from our team. Uh, Dr. Shell. Okay, obviously a few of the questions were answered, particularly with Jody talking about change and the uh, need to, that emotions are okay and how to manage screen time. That was another question here, of course. And one of the serious questions is the affordability of accessing a psychologist or registered counsellor. And I think, and I know that uh, your GP can refer you to a registered clinical psychologist and there is a Medicare rebate for that. But then as the, uh, it is a lady, so, well, what happens then for continuation of care when the money runs out? And on the other hand, we do have financial support in this community. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword here. One is referring under the Medicare Act. And two, uh, that is sort of a limited number of episodes. And for all of you, as psychologists, you know, sometimes Rome wasn't built in a day, nor is it the ability to, to work with people over one or two sessions. It does require more than the one hour, Dan. You're quite right. In fact, a number of hours. So if anybody wants to answer that one about affordability and access. May I direct it to Jodie first, if I may? Uh, well, I like to make myself redundant as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, typically, anxiety problems can be turned around fast, really. And uh, with the right evidence-based, which means scientifically supported strategies, anxiety uh, I don't even say treatment. I'm very reticent to see anxiety in a medical model because sure. it's so part of who we are as human beings. But typically with the right approaches, these problems can be remedied quickly. Now, sometimes, you know, obviously that's not always the case, but classically anxiety problems can really be um, uh, res resolved to a point of empowering individuals with a practical toolkit that they can take forward in life. And I very much love to incorporate uh, parents in my sessions for children and, uh, and younger teenagers as well, because that actually facilitates and fast tracks the process as well. So it's really all about optimized treatment approaches and also recognizing the abundance of different kinds of therapy and, and opportunities for care. And as Dee said, apps, you know, we are so fortunate. So the key message is let's destigmatize. Let's not think that we're weak to be needing this help. Let's support each other and seek out the help that you need if you are suffering. There is no reason in society that we live in now that anybody should be suffering in silence. Okay, Could so I come back to you, Alan, as a GP and say, there must be a, a, a proportion of your patients, and it may be small, for whom the words that Jodie used earlier 
prolonged fear, suffering and avoidance are characteristics where they're needing more than whatever the Medicare number of, of allocated sessions are. You mentioned there can be community support. Could you just tell us a little bit more about that? Just in case there's someone with us tonight for whom a, 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 a shorter number of sessions is not sufficient. What, what, how could the community help them? I would think that Jewish care, COA, depending on the level of, I guess, age, um, Jewish House would have counsellors and opportunities to find financial assistance. I'm sure Dee would agree sometimes with our schools, there are children who are there who are being supported by the community and may need special care. So there are services out there and people I think just have to make that first effort making a connection um, and to seek help. Yeah, that's the first thing. Financial assistance to dog there, it's okay. And Dee, would you like to quickly comment and we'll take one last question and then I'll hand over to Alan to close. Absolutely. A, a quick, you know, school counsellors and school psychologists are amazing resources. They're at the school. They can help you to find, yeah. um, you know, the correct help that you need. And all the online tools that I actually spoke about, Headspace and Smiling Mind Brave, they're all actually free and there are no cost. Okay, so there are some that, that cost money, but, but these are all free. And I also think, I'm sure everyone will agree, that over this time, we have seen how um, healthcare and, and telehealth has just expanded. And there are so many lines that people can phone. And so reach out to your GP, reach out to, at the school, to your school psychologist, reach out to anybody that can, you know, don't suffer alone. And we will help you find the right treatment, you know, for you. And Zach, so just a quick comment from you, this notion which you may challenge that boys may be less willing to seek help. Is there any special comment in relation to boys and young men? For sure. I, I think telling them that it's not going to necessarily work the first time around, believing that it's a magic pill is something that's really dangerous. Um, there's also a lot of evidence showing that, um, you know, medication doesn't go that well with, with some boys who feel like they're losing control. So telling them, all right, if, you don't, if that's not the way you want to go, Let's sit down with this person and, um, and we'll work through it. And if this doesn't work and you don't get along with them, that's really important as well. I'll admit in my first session with someone that this works, works both ways. You know, it's, 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 it's a relationship. It's a two-way street. And really, we need to build on, on a relationship that we think is going to be useful. One, one last question, Alan, please. Yes, but it's a very difficult one because how do we help a reluctant teenager who refuses help? Uh, what I would like to do is get, if I may, from our four people, a brief remark from each of you. Daniel, the reluctant teenager, what would you say? Um, well, I, I think it's, I haven't, I think one of the concerns at the moment is device use over COVID. And that's not something we've really covered tonight. Um, but I, I think there are always, things going on behind and we and as Zach was saying we've got to work out what those things are and some of them unfortunately are related to addiction and needing to get off the addiction because we've had the excuse of but mum it's social so um and we've all been sort of struggling in our own way and many times our children at the moment have really had a lot of times on screens and there are a lot of dopamine hits and other sorts of things so I'll stop because I want everyone else to have a turn, but I think there's some other issues to think about with reluctance and what's really going on. Thank you very much. And Jodie, what would you say? Um, I love working with reluctant teenagers. I, it's, it's a, you know, I mean, I work with all ages. However, teenagers, there's something incredibly special about this age group because it's so filled with complexity and filled with challenge and a really scrutinizing audience for sure. Um, it's very much at that age, it's very much about um, a, a relationship of authenticity and, uh, Non, a non-patronizing, authentic relationship uh, in, a, in a clinical environment, and then um, empowering them to just, once you've got that with the, you know, a relationship of trust, and there's that connection, then you can move towards um, practical strategies that ver make a very big difference. Um, and I'm sure Dee would, would have exceptional things to say about this as well. Well, I might come to Dee next and then I'll give the last word to, to Zach. Dee, your comment on 
the reluctant, you must face this yeah. in a school environment. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that for parents, the most important thing is an ongoing message every single day. We love you. We are here for you. We care about you. And you can always talk to us. And sometimes you're going to get, as parents say to me, the grunt, you know, that we, they just grunt at us. They don't really talk. And I say, it doesn't matter if they're grunting. Sometimes they want to close the door. And yes, of course, you've got to give them privacy. But you know what? Get into that room and say to them, I just want you to know I'm here for you. I love you and I want to help you and you can always come and talk to me and just give them that message consistently and constantly. Thank you and Zach. I don't like seeing clients that want to see me. There's no fun in that. I only see clients that don't want to see me. I like a challenge. <laughs> but I definitely think that there is something to be said for stepped care. You know, as, as clinical psychologists, we should kind of be at the pointy end in the grand scheme of things. Um, if, if somebody is reluctant to talk to us, I understand. Um, I, you know, I obviously would like them to in the grand scheme of things, but there is definitely other support processes throughout the way where we can integrate them into a system that eventually gets hopefully to, to them connecting with us. So firstly, finding a mentor and someone who's going to be able to get across to them if they're not going to listen to you, linking up with their friends, having meaningful conversations, getting, you know, a grandfather, whoever it may be to, to work through that relationship. Don't expect this to be, um, you know, a happen in the blink of an eye um, it takes time but if you show uh, resilience and and you know a constant passion for, for their well-being I think that they'll respect you in the long term as well well ladies and gentlemen I'm going to pass in just one moment to Dr Shell to close proceedings but can I just say what a, an enormous pleasure it's been to talk to all of you and uh, I would just like to uh, say I didn't raise it in the conversation I just forgot but I think Zach's reference to positive masculinity uh, is such an important message. And as a daughter, I would say it's very important for girls too, uh, as well as boys. So thank you for that, for that message and that encouragement to men in the community and fathers uh, to, be, to be proactive. And uh, Alan, uh, take it away. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Thanks very much. Obviously, there are many questions. We've got a few late ones here now. I think one that the big one has been about screen time and are we actually being effective in continuing with screen time and you're saying that we have all this access to lots of websites so that requires a bit of intelligence to find out which one is not fake news or fake advice that's a big problem for all of us uh, so i think you know as we have another two sessions coming up uh, over the next four weeks then we'll have an opportunity to answer some of these questions that have come in a bit late but are very relevant um, and i can only say that it's been only the beginning of the journey for some people who've just come in, you know, as they said, this has been an opportunity to focus, to see what's happening in your household and maybe to then seek help because you see there are problems. And it's been a wonderful evening of information. And I hope that people are not afraid to ask Jewish Care for financial assistance. They're, they're there to help us, uh, COA, older people. So we really have, and, and all the other servers out there, the, the social work system is there to help us access hello um, obviously so thank you again to Julie our wonderful MC I like to say that to all our attendees who have been excellent and uh, we appreciate we will uh, with their permission provide people with their details for contact uh, in the email that goes out with other information about our other community services that are available uh, we do have another well-being evening coming up on June the 17th which is the path back to a new normal uh, talking about depression and anxiety and suicide risk and that'll be well uh, partnered with uh, Jewish care and of course all I can say is that um, this has been a bit different to our usual seminars because we usually like to say thank you and good night but we'd like to say thank you and good night thank you to Julie thank you attendees thank you everybody we had over a, well over 100 people for most of the evening and uh, we look forward to catching up with you on the 17th of June and it's worth listening to all of the sessions. All three will be very helpful to everybody. So thank you, stay well and stay safe and good night.